بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We start in the name of Allah the most gracious, the most merciful We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Lord of the worlds رب referring to the one who is the nourisher, the cherisher the sustainer, the provider, the, pre- the protector, the curer, the one in whose hands lies absolute control of every aspect of existence. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because Allah chose him to be sent to us to remove us from the darkness and to bring us to the light. We send blessings and salutations upon all the messengers of Allah who were chosen by him to come to mankind and to guide them with the light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. We ask Allah to bless the the beloved companions, the blessed household and every one of us here in Bradford. Say Ameen. MashaAllah. Those who are here, those who are not here too. Our children, our offspring, those to come right up to the end, humanity at large, may Allah bless all of us. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, always made people feel very, very important. Everyone, when he saw a child, he actually paused for a moment and gave the child such importance that the child felt empowered. Subhanallah. Are you a good Muslim? Who thinks they're reasonable Muslims? Don't be ashamed. Put up your hand. Reasonable Muslims. Put up your hands. Come on, come on, come on. Put up your hands a bit higher. Come on, guys. MashaAllah. I think we all are reasonable Muslims. And we all are, if there may be from amongst us, those who are not Muslim, perhaps, at least you are a reasonable human being, right? We supposed to, We are supposed to be having decent character and conduct to say the least, right? My brothers, my sisters, if you're a true Muslim, if you want to be a follower of Islam, we know the pillars of Islam. We know how many are they, by the way? Say them loud. You said we're reasonable Muslims. Five, mashallah. That's someone coming from outside Bradford. Subhanallah. You can tell. It's like, thank you, sister. By the way, you deserve a medal. It's a pity I don't have one right now. May Allah bless you. That Amin was better than a medal. MashaAllah. So I promise you, five pillars, we know them. Worship Allah alone. We believe the messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final messenger. We want to follow him, etc. We believe in, we, we try to pray, we try to fulfill our, you know, the fasting in Ramadan in the best possible way, the charities to the poor, Those of us who can afford the Hajj, we've already been there or we are planning to go there or we are praying that we can afford it one day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it all from us. MashaAllah. The Ameens are definitely louder than other places. That's a bonus. It will make me want to come back here again very soon. I love it because you never know when is the moment of acceptance of prayers, right? You never know because the angels are right here right now. Do you know that? Didn't you hear brother was saying the angels? True, the angels. And you know what? When it's a moment of acceptance of prayer and you are busy saying Amin or you're saying a prayer, you hit the jackpot. You hit the jackpot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us at least a few times in our lives. MashaAllah, that's even louder. So my brothers and sisters, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, like I said, we know the pillars, but sometimes we behave in a way that is actually so embarrassing. On one hand, we claim to be the ambassadors of this beloved, beautiful messenger. And on the other hand, we are such an embarrassment that people dislike Islam and they dislike Astaghfirullah, the messenger, peace be upon him, simply because of the way we behave. We behave in a ridiculous way. 
Wallahi, I'm going to share something with you. I was traveling with a brother. And you know what? He was a guest from another country. And there was a family. No, no offense if it was you. But anyway, there was, there was a family driving in a small little car. I think it was a Nissan Micra or Micra. I don't know. How do you pronounce that? Micra. In British. In mashallah. Okay, fine. Don't worry. I'll get it. The Nissan Micra, subhanallah. And guess what? They were zooming at 100 miles an hour. And when I saw this car, I told the brother, brother, these are Muslims. I said, most probably practicing. And guess what? I decided to step up a bit, mashallah. And the brother slowed down a little bit. I think he must have felt embarrassed because to be honest with you, something happened. I'll tell you just now. But as we passed them, I was wondering, he's got his phone and his phone in his hand and he's driving and he's busy taking a picture of who? Of me in my car. And the guy next to me tells me, how did you know they're Muslims? I said, you know, the problem is we have something known as laying your trust in Allah, even when you're breaking the law. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. The guy must have said, Tawakkal to Allah, let's go. And he's speeding. It can only be a Muslim who really relies on Allah so much that he's got such a lousy vehicle, but he's whacking it on the highway like you can't believe, subhanAllah. And he doesn't mind. His tires are about to probably pop, but he's, it's okay. Why? I read my Atul Kursi. Do you know that? I did my dua, you know? And look at the embarrassment. On top of that, he's waving at me. And I'm thinking, you're waving your phone at me, my brother. And you don't realize that it's, so, you, you know, you could just die. He must be thinking it's such a blessed death if I were to die right now. No way. It's illegal. It's unacceptable. Never use the fact that you've prayed to perpetrate or to engage in that which is criminal or unacceptable. It doesn't mean, I said, Now the cops won't see me. People believe that, right? They read the dua. Dua not to be seen by the cops when you're traveling. Oh, subhanallah. It's one of the most read duas by some. I see them laughing. It's part of Surah Yasin. It means, it means, and we have placed a bar before them and a bar behind them so that they don't see. That's what it means. It's referring to those who are astray and you think it refers to the cops or the speed cameras or something. May Allah forgive us. We've downgraded the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We become an embarrassment to humanity. We become a statistic. People who don't abide by the basic safety rules claiming I'm a good Muslim. Where are you? By the way, it's a small minority. But the problem is, as much as they're a small minority, it's a big deal because you and I know that the media creates a hype when a Muslim sneezes. Right? Huge hype. Muslim guy sneezed. Everyone ran away. Subhanallah, it happens. We have to go the extra mile to ensure that if someone were to look at us, to speak to us, we behave in a way that they would really be so intrigued and impressed. They would want to know what is the driving force behind your perpetual smile? What is the driving force behind your positivity? What is it? It's your faith in the Almighty. What's the driving force behind the goodness that emanates from you? It's the beauty of the faith I follow. I was telling you this brother, the reason why we were able to catch up with him, as I stepped up a bit, he realized who it was. He slowed down. That's what happened. So he actually slowed down because of the person he thought he saw. And when he confirmed it, he, he engaged in another crime. That was the phone. Imagine you're breaking the speed and you're on the phone. The speed limit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So I said, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made sure that 
people felt very important. How many of us give importance to children? You see a child, we don't even notice the child. Moments ago, I was with a good friend of mine. We went to see someone. And this brother, mashallah, he's a well-known brother. And I noticed something. May Allah bless him. He's not here so I can talk about him. Good, not bad. I noticed something and I picked it up and I said, I'm going to talk about this tonight. That inspired me to speak about it. Guess what it was? We visited a boxer with another boxer and a rugby player. And I noticed that when we walked in, we sat down. He took a moment to speak to one of the young boys who was with us. I just watched and I said, this man has refined his character. Do you hear what I'm saying? I can tell because it requires an effort initially to do that. By the way, it was Sonny Bill Williams. We went to see Amir Khan about an hour back and we were sitting. His wife's given birth. Alhamdulillah, both of their wives gave birth. Mashallah. I don't know if it's something to do with boxing or, or rugby. Mashallah. But anyway, may Allah bless everyone who has children with goodness. Make them the coolness of your eyes. Those who don't have children, may Allah bless you with children. And I've said it at this venue the last time. Even if you're not married, just say Amin aloud. Say it. May Allah bless you with children. Say Amin. Do you know why? Because if you're not married, in order for Allah to give you that, He has to give you something before that. And that's a blessed marriage. So if Allah is going to give you children who are going to be the coolness of your eyes, he has to start off by giving you a spouse who's going to be the coolness of your eyes. Hence, that Amin is like a two in one. Don't worry, the sisters are laughing because the only two in one they know is the shampoo. Mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Gave the children importance. When I see a rugby player, Muslim, and he's a serious Muslim, by the way, you know, meaning he's a, quite a practicing brother. And you know what? I noticed he just made the child feel important. Hey, a small question or two. That's it. Carry on. Do you do that? I want you to change your life, my brothers and sisters. Make people feel important. Make them feel important. Starting with children, another. When someone is challenged with some form of what we call a disability, but it's actually being abled differently. Because if Allah takes one thing away from you, He gives you something else in a bigger way. Those who cannot hear sometimes are, are, are much sharper than those who can hear. Those who cannot see sometimes their ears can hear things that are, you know, at a distance and you'll be shocked. They can pick up voices from a mile and tell you, is that brother here? And you're wondering, how do you? No, man. Well, if Allah took one thing away from me, he's going to polish up the other. So you're abled in a different way. But those people, they don't want you to pity them. No, never. They don't want you. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, you don't have a leg. Hey, I don't have a leg. It's one of those things. Subhanallah. I'm probably walking more than you are in my own way. I'm achieving more than you are. So as abled as we think we are, we actually achieve less than them because they've been challenged and man can only achieve when he's out of his box, out of the comfort zone. That's when you start achieving. When Allah wants to bless you, he takes things away from you. All of us in our lives without a single exception, we are where we are simply because Allah closed certain doors for us in our lives. Do you agree with that? Allah closed some doors. Had he opened every door you wanted, you wouldn't have been here today. You'd have been somewhere else. You might have even been a failure. You might have been whatever else. But Allah says, I know I'll close this door, that door, because I'm maneuvering you to a direction you would never have imagined you got to. I am here also because doors were closed. So when a door closes, it is a blessing matter of time and the condition is look at it positively get up walk sprint in the direction that you can it is a blessing you would never have believed how fast you can run until the lion chases you do you agree mashallah
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So my brothers and sisters, you pick up refined character. You give people importance. Someone is disabled, we call them. Like I say, it is an English term. It's not derogatory. It actually does refer to some, you know, disability. However, like I say, there, there are more refined terms to refer to that. Some people prefer to say the, the differently abled. Some people say the challenged and so on. All of that refers to something similar, but they don't want your pity. All they want from you is to acknowledge them as equal humans. That's all equal humans. If someone is darker than you in complexion, all that is required of you is never ever to comment about their complexion. This is Bradford. I don't even want to ask you how many of you have ever commented about others complexions because I think I'll be embarrassed. People are worried about how fair they are and how dark they are. I tell you, the Almighty says it clearly. Your entry into paradise has nothing to do with your race, nothing to do with your color, nothing to do with the size or shape of your body or how much you weighed. Imagine you weigh and you strive to lose one stone, half a stone. You strive, you struggle. I promise you, if you had struggles, half of that dedication if you had to struggle just a little bit not even a struggle to get closer to the almighty you'd shed some of your spiritual baggage far quicker than you would shed your own weight and by the way it's not bad it's not bad to what to be a few kilos this way and that way nothing wrong don't get too obsessed. I remember visiting a country and they were talking about one of the girls who wanted to get married. And obviously every culture has its own taste and has its own understanding and so on. And they were talking about a certain girl getting married. And one of the brothers said she won't find a husband. This was somewhere in Africa, by the way. And I, I was shocked. I said, brother, you cannot say that. You know, astaghfirullah. It's, he said, no, man, she's nothing. She must eat potatoes and whatever. The, in our culture, you can only get married if you're 70 kilos or more. Have you ever heard that? I looked at him. I said, in my culture, most of the girls would be disqualified. <laughs> Subhanallah. May Allah grant us forgiveness, protection. Something you look at as positive, others look at as negative. You see, it's a matter of where you come from, your culture. Allah says, I'm not going to judge you by your weight. Try your best. You must be fit. Don't say, I'm a Muslim. Like I say, it's okay. It's okay. I can weigh as much as I want. No, you cannot. You must take pride in what you look like, in what you feel like, in your health. You must learn to do something about it, but don't become obsessed. That's what we're saying. Obsession means now it stresses you just because of one pimple on your face. Not at all. I've got 10, by the way. It's fine. My brothers and sisters, let's refine ourselves. You see someone darker than you, taller than you, shorter than you, very thin, huge. No problem. Greet them. Smile at them. Make them feel important. Give them that empowering, the sense of belonging. It will help them. And guess what? More than it helps them. You did yourself a favor. The Muslims are taught that when you give a charity, say from amongst us, there's a multimillionaire. And inshallah, they are. And they were to give a charity to a poor person. A Muslim should never think that, you know what? I did the man a favor. Impossible. You didn't. He did you a favor. By what? By accepting a charity. Allah created a poor person in order. What do you think? For the rich to become arrogant. In order for your act of worship to be accepted and a charity is one of the biggest acts of worship. The hadith, the prophet Muhammad prophesizes, may peace be upon him, that close to the end of time, there will be so much of wealth that there will not be a poor person to give money to, to give your charity to. 
I promise you when Bitcoin was hitting 20,000, I felt we're coming to the time. Then Allah blessed us by it dropping a bit. We haven't yet come to the time. But you know what? There can come a time when everyone has so much that if you want to give a charity, the guy will say, who, who are you insulting here? Man? You follow what I'm saying? So while you can give the charity, who is fortunate? Allah is going to close the door of charity at one stage, meaning monetary. For a while, not forever, but for a while. You won't find a poor person. So when you see a poor person, consider yourself fortunate. In Surah Al-Duha, Allah says, the one who's begging, the one who's asking, don't ever rebuke him. Why? It's all got to do with how you make them feel. Honor. Such that you don't even make a public show of the fact that I helped this guy. That's why he is alive. Many of us do it. You say, brother, if it wasn't for me, you would have been in the dumps. That statement doesn't come from a true believer. Never. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha. O you who believe, do not destroy the reward of your charities by bragging about it and by harming those after you have been charitable. That means, if I give you a charity and I brag about it, I've just nullified the reward of it. I'm supposed to humble myself. I'm supposed to make you feel more important than I. Even though the world might think you did a favor, the person might also believe you, you did a favor. But you know what? You, if you are refined, you look at it in a different way. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Bring yourself to the understanding that you're supposed to be upon. Never ever maltreat people based on their financial standing social standing sometimes we only greet the rich and famous sometimes we're only you know acknowledging people who look a certain way the day you can acknowledge people who look totally different people who are from perhaps a totally different background a different race different nationality different religion different background the day you can acknowledge them and respect them for the fact that they are human they share with you the common factor the common forefather subhanallah who was your greatest grandfather brother what was his name your greatest grandfather how could you not know who knows adam who was your greatest grandfather what was his name Adam, you're right. So we're related, mashallah. We're all related here. I knew it. When I walked in, I said, oh, my cousins are all here waiting for me. Subhanallah. Yes, you are. It's the love you feel when you've realized that I'm a human. If I'm a human, you're a human. I don't care where you've suddenly ended up, you know, Bradford or wherever else. I don't care. I don't care if you're... You know, if the children of that man somehow someone ended up in Nigeria and the other one ended up in America and the other one was still, you know, wherever in, in the Middle East and one was in Pakistan and the other was in India. You have to acknowledge if you're a refined human being that after all, we're brothers and sisters in humanity. The day you acknowledge that, that's the day you inched towards understanding who your maker is. Because that it's the same maker who made them, made you. I'm trying to impress the same creator who created everyone else. So if he created everyone else and I'm so loving and kind to all his creatures, surely he'll be impressed with me. And if I'm nasty to one creature of the Almighty, do you think he's going to be impressed with me? He made that creature. You follow what I'm saying? And we call ourselves religious. See what I'm saying? Understand Allah. That's why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, tells us the Almighty will not have mercy on the one who doesn't have mercy on the rest of mankind as a starting point. Statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
Allah does not have mercy upon those who don't have mercy on other human beings. That why do I say a starting point? Because it extends beyond that to animals, to birds, to the fish, to the ecosystem. You need to have mercy on your own ecosystem by doing what? Preserving it. That's a Muslim. That's a beautiful person. You're worried about pollution, perhaps from your own system. You're worried about other things in the environment. You want litter. You want, that's what makes you a good Muslim. So I started off by telling you the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made people feel important. Do you want to know to what extent? To what extent? What do you think? Who was, who was his best friend? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Please say his name. Say it. Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. How many from among you know the real name of Abu Bakr? Put up your hands. Besides from this table. Okay. You know the real name of Abu Bakr. Okay. If you've heard the, the name Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, put up your hands. You heard the name Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Put down your hands. That was the best friend of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay. Two years younger. The best friend. And can I tell you what else? He was one of the best of all the companions, if not the best in rank. His name was Abdullah. Did you ever know that? And his father was Uthman. His father's name was Uthman. So his name was actually Abdullah bin Uthman. And they used to call him Abu Bakr. And they used to call his father Abu Quhafa. So they used to call him Abu Bakr ibn Abi Quhafa. But his real name was Abdullah. It's like how we have names for ourselves. Waz. I still don't know what Waz stands for. Mashallah. What is it by the way? Wasim. Mashallah. Wasim. Mashallah. May Allah grant you goodness, my brother. No ghibah. You're right in front of me. So my brothers and sisters, to what extent did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, make people feel important? Let me explain. The companions say, لا يحسب جليسه أن أحدا أكرم عليه منه. That is by far one of the most powerful statements when it comes to seeing how the Prophet ﷺ made people feel around him. It says the companions are saying, none of those in his company ever felt that there was anyone more honored than himself to the prophet wow that's a miracle that is a miracle imagine i'm sitting with a thousand people and every one of the thousand believes this guy likes me the most how's that how is that this guy is the closest to me how is that mashallah I can see one of my, one of my best friends as I was growing up. Mashallah, and we went to school together for many years. After high school, he shifted to England and I went elsewhere to Saudi Arabia. And he's sitting here with me today. No offense, my brother, you're still my best buddy. Because I'm just saying, there are people who will feel I'm, I'm the closest. That is an honor. It, go, it depicts that you really are close. And perhaps as you develop yourself, and like I said earlier, you have to work hard. You have to work hard to develop yourself. It's not good enough to go home today and say it was a good lecture. No. Now, make your mind up. I'm going to work hard. The way I speak to my family members to begin with, my colleagues at work, my others, like I told you, Muslim, non-Muslim, white or black or green or purple or whatever nationality, it's okay. The fact that they're human, make them feel important, man. If you have differences, if you want to teach them something, if you want to reach out to them in one way or another, the fact that you made them feel important would be the biggest entry point ever. They would trust you. They would listen to you. You know, when you get people coming to preach religion, many people don't want to listen to them. Why? Simple reason. They feel disconnected. 
This man came in, he just shoved everything down our throats. He walked out. He didn't show any compassion or care for me and the issues I'm going through. And we all have unique issues. Everyone. Nobody from amongst us can claim you don't have a problem. You've got a problem. And if you don't, it's coming. Subhanallah. I don't mean it in a bad way, but it's the Almighty's plan. He says you will be tested. And you know what? That's what makes you a better person. Your challenges. People say, why does Allah test us? Now the young children asked me, you said Allah tests us. Why does he have to test us? I said, well, you go to school. Why does the teacher test you? Well, the teacher tests me in order to know whether I know my stuff and to get me to the next level. I said, that's exactly what Allah does. He tests you in order to, to see if you know your stuff and he gets you to the next level. And when you get to the next level, will the test be easier or more difficult? Do you ever find an A-level question? One plus one. Not at all. You won't. Whenever I, whenever I give the example of one plus one, something comes to my mind. It was a lesson of honesty that we learned many, many years ago. And, uh, you know, they say, initially, they had picked on certain colors and races. But as I refined it, we removed the colors and races. Because even when you're joking, you shouldn't say the Pakistani and the Indian and the this. No, if it's derogatory, take that out. Refine yourself. You know, when I was a little bit younger and we were not yet as refined, we sometimes used to laugh at these things. Now I actually send a message back to the brothers on my phone or whoever it was. I said, you know what? Think about what was said. You could have joked without an insult. May Allah forgive me and all of us and make us more conscious of it. So they say there were three guys. They went to apply for a job as an accountant, right? By the way, I was told recently that accounting is going to be taken over by computers very, very soon. So anyone becoming a CA, you know, the lifespan of it, you're going to have to go into crypto very soon. May Allah forgive you and forgive me. I might be totally wrong. Okay. It's not my topic. I should keep quiet, right? Mashallah, mashallah. So three guys going to the interview. What did they want? The job as the accountant. So the first guy walks in and he comes out in a minute. So the other two waiting said, what happened? He said, I don't know. I walked in. He said, what's one plus one? I said two. And he said, you can leave. I said, why? So the other two now knew that, hey, there's something wrong. The next guy goes in and comes out in a minute. So the third guy sitting there says, what happened? He said, he did the same thing to me. He said, but you're such a fool. If you knew two was wrong, why did he? He said, no, I didn't say two. Because I knew two was wrong, right? I said, 11. Because one and one, technically, if you put the two together, it makes 11. So, you know, technical mind, I might get the job. He said, you can leave. The third guy says, ha, ha, ha. This guy probably needs a different answer. So he enters. Like I told you, the initial joke has nationalities next to it. We don't put nationalities. We leave it blank. You'll still have a good laugh, right? Why are you laughing, bro? I haven't even told you the joke. So he walks in and he gets the job. He got the job. Guess why he got the job? The boss says, what's one plus one? He says, wait, let me close the curtains. He closed the curtains. Can I turn off the lights? He said, turn off the lights. Okay, let me whisper in your ear. He says, okay, what would you like it to be? They say, that's a real accountant. Mashallah. Allah forgive us. <laughs> May Allah forgive us. Did you hear that? I see, we laughed. Mashallah. May Allah forgive us. Obviously, that's a joke, guys. That's a total joke. It's got nothing. You know what? You have to be upright. Please don't whisper in people's ears and start doctoring all your accounts. Mashallah. But my brothers and sisters, the reason why I brought it up is whenever I say one plus one, it brings me back to this, something I heard years back. And it's still quite an impressive joke, right? Because part of it is true in some circles. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made everyone feel so important. The brothers, the sisters, meaning the men, the women, the children, the old, the others, I give you one example. Bilal ibn Rabah anhu, was, was a man from Habasha. Habasha 
is somewhere where Ethiopia is today. So he was an African from Africa, Habasha. He was before Islam a slave and Islam taught the companions to free the slaves, free them until they were all free. They were all set free. It started off with Abu Bakr, the same man, Abdullah ibn Uthman radiallahu anhumah. He used to buy the slaves and then free them. Buy them from an owner, one of the people of Quraysh. Buy them and then free them. Buy them and then free them. And in that way, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that whoever does that, they freed themselves on the day of judgment. So if you wanted to be free from a punishment, you had to buy one of these people who were oppressed completely, unacceptably and free them. You know, people don't talk about this, but that's Islam. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq decided to buy Bilal ibn Rabah and free him. He was a slave. When he freed him, the honor and the dignity that he got as a Muslim, he was one of the champions. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went up in Mi'raj and Allah showed him Jannah and Jahannam, meaning heaven and hell and the heavens and whatever else. He came back onto the earth and guess what he said? He says, imagine everyone is sitting and waiting to listen. You know, what is he going to say? He's going to describe for us his journey. He started describing and he says, where is Bilal? Out of all the people, where is Bilal? Imagine you're looking for a person, subhanallah, who was a slave. Probably the darkest in complexion. But the Prophet ﷺ says, where is Bilal? He says, Bilal, سَمِعْتُ خَشْخَشَتَكَ فِي الْجَنَّةِ He says, when I was in Jannah, I heard your footsteps. La ilaha illallah. Look at this. I heard your footsteps. It goes to show that entry into paradise has nothing to do with your color. It's got to do with your heart. Inna Allah Ta'ala la yanzuru ila suwarikum wa la ila ajusamikum wa lakin yanzuru ila qulubikum wa a'malikum. That's a statement of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. He says, Allah does not look at what you look like and your bodies. Straight. Allah does not look at your bodies or what you look like. He looks at your deeds and your hearts. That's what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us. But with us, no way. This guy is like this, that guy is like that. Watch out for this, they're thieves. Can I tell you something that will bite? It will bite before the food comes. Okay. A lot of us, if not almost all of us, feel within our hearts that my tribe is better than the one next door. My people, my village, my city, my this, my that. Say what you want. I'm speaking facts. The day you get rid of that, call yourself a good Muslim. What's up with your nationality? I know people coming from the subcontinent, they won't allow their kids to marry a person from the village next door. Do you know some of them? Thank you. I got the yes I wanted. They won't. I know people who won't allow a child to marry a person from a different nationality or from another part of the world, a different race. What for? You haven't understood Allah and they'll use religious blackmail to try and prove to you that you know what? It's not right. It can't be. Imagine if Adam had to hear that my kids are going to fight one day. One's not going to allow the other to marry the child. That's what's been happening now. Good people, religious, longer the beard, bigger the problem. Sometimes. Okay. It's a fact. My brothers and sisters eradicate that. People have been given importance. Everyone is important. Greet people, greet those who least expect it. They will be shocked. You know, we have, for example, volunteers who, who will be volunteering. You know, sometimes, and I do this because like I say, you have to think about it. You have to force yourself, you know, to, to, to discipline yourself. Think about it. Go to people and, you know, say a word that will move them. You can, everyone can. And you know, Allah will elevate you as a result of that. You have people who are going to serve us right at the end. You might want to take a moment to say to one of them. Thank you very much. You guys did a very good job. Someone broke a glass. 
Wait, natural instinct, people start thinking, you know what, what happened here? They start getting upset and angry. I hope things are changing now. If you're a good Muslim, the glass is broken, it was broken, it's shattered, it's never going to return. But Allah made it happen in front of you just to watch how you reacted. The angels have written how you reacted and you go to the next issue and you failed. Why? You made a tantrum. Your own child, your own spouse, your own mother or someone who might be a helping hand at home. And you know what? You lost your cool because they bumped the car. Forget the car. Today I had someone who said, you know what? I bumped this car in the front and I said, well, if you bumped it a bit more, they might have replaced it for you. It's true, right? May Allah grant us goodness. No one bashes their vehicles intentionally. It's how you react to it that would actually make you a good Muslim, a good human being. So this is why we say those who least expect it. Allah says about the beggar. I, I read the verse before you. Allah says, don't ever rebuke the beggar. You know, someone comes to you, they have these signs, you know. In South Africa, it says, I am not an armed robber. So please give me something. And they have a placard and they're holding it at the traffic light. Hey, that's like something serious. Because South Africa, you and I know is very dangerous, right? Some parts of it, dangerous. So you look and you say, well, in essence, the man is true. Wallahi, when I saw the guy not too long ago with a similar placard, I started looking at his pockets and checking if there was, you know, from a distance, if there was anything looking like a firearm there, man. You know, and they, they obviously wasn't. But it's just that... You start thinking, why would he choose those words to say, I'm not an armed robber? And I was thinking, you have two arms. We all have two arms, don't we? Mashallah, there's one and there's another one. Mashallah. My brothers and sisters, don't rebuke a person. You don't know what it took them to be begging. Yes, we don't encourage it. Yes, if you're able, you're encouraged to find a job, work, go out. But that's for that person. What about for us? We don't know that particular person's circumstances. So as much as when we are talking to people in general, we will tell them, don't beg, don't ask. It's a very bad thing to go and ask when Allah's given you the ability and capacity. But then for us, we are told that when people beg, don't rebuke them because you don't know what drove them to begging. It is as a last resort. Permissible. You follow what I'm saying? Last resort. We need something. A charity might ask you, please donate to this cause, donate to that cause. You know what? It is permissible to do that. May Allah grant us goodness. So my brothers and sisters, I want you to take home a lesson. From now, let's become more conscious of how we make people feel. No matter who it is, no matter what they've done. A person, you know, one brother called me one day and he was having a huge family dispute with, you know, a huge dispute. And he says, what should I do? I said, calm down, sit down, relax. Perhaps you guys can go your own ways for a while. Don't react right now because you guys are going to hurt each other. Think about it. Muhammad, peace be upon him. A young man comes to him and says, you know, he got his moment with the messenger. You know what that means? You got the messenger. Muhammad, peace be upon him. Just imagine Jesus, may peace be upon him in front of you. And you get, a, you get a few moments with him. What are you going to do? Moses, may peace be upon him right in front of you. You get a moment. What are you going to do? What are you going to say to him? It's just your moment. So sometimes people don't know how to react. You know, they don't know what to say and what to do because they overwhelmed with emotion. So this young man, energetic, he comes, he says, Oh, messenger, give me advice. Give me advice. Now, instead of saying, but I've been talking all along, didn't you hear? You know, the messenger says, La taqba. Don't get angry. Imagine I'm sitting with the messenger, peace be upon him, asking him, give me advice. And I'm thinking he's going to give me a nice, good little, you know, uh, message and a lovely, long sort of a talk to say, listen, well, you know, you should do this. And you, he just said, La taqba. Don't get angry. So the boy says, well, we've got a bit more time. And I've heard what he said. So he says, give me more advice. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, looks at him and says, don't get angry. And he thinks, okay, okay, give me more advice. And he kept saying the same thing. You know, one narration says, Hatta qulna sakata. Until those around, 
they said, I hope this guy can keep quiet. Because, you know, he's saying the same thing and he's getting the same answer. And on other occasions, when people ask the messenger for advice, he said different things. So why did he say, don't get angry to this guy? Perhaps he knew the man has anger issues, right? Perhaps he knew the young, energetic guy, bubbling and bursting in his energies, needed a reminder to say, don't get angry. Calm down. I'm telling you today, my brothers and sisters, many of us, sometimes with everyone, sometimes with a selected few, sometimes with those who are vulnerable, we maltreat them. We think low of them. We think too much of ourselves. I promise you, I have met people, some very wealthy people. I've met some extremely wealthy people. I met a guy and I'm letting you know, who perhaps is worth about 20 billion US. Did you hear what I just said? You might wonder, who the hell was that? Who the hell was that? And I tell you the humbleness and the humility. I told myself, you know what? I've met guys with five pounds who think they're so, so big in terms of their deal. And look at this guy. He's, he comes, he spoke. I want to tell you something else. Something I figured out and I'm going to say it for the first time. You know, Bill Gates, people know him because that's a name, one of the wealthiest, one of the top in the world in terms of wealth. I've, I heard something, I heard a little video of his and I was interested in listening to another one, not because of anything, because something came across very loud and clear for a guy like me. I'm not interested in his wealth. I'm not interested in anything, but, and I've never even followed him. But when I heard him on one of the videos, just by chance on Instagram, I decided to go to YouTube and to search for it. And I heard this whole interview. And then I went to another one and a third one. And I promise you what came across loud and clear. I hope I'm correct. And I think I am. The man has some refined character and conduct. Simple guy, down to earth. It seems like his compassion is way beyond the amount of money he's got. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. That's what impressed me. Bill Gates, not a Muslim. And I can tell you that about him being a person who has no clue. More than just what I heard. I've never met him. I don't think I would. Meaning I don't, it's not like I'm going to avoid him, but I don't think we'd cross paths, right? But well done, mashallah. I learned to think. What did I learn? That you know what? This guy is the who's who. And look at how humble he is. The real powerful are those who are so humble that you don't even know the difference. Those are the real guys. Subhanallah. I always tell people, if you think you're hot, there are those who are hotter than you, but much more humble. If you think you're wealthy, there are those wealthier than you, but much more humble. If you think you're powerful, there are those much more powerful than you, but very humble. So what are you lacking? You're lacking humility. That's what you're lacking. Let's build our humility. At the end of the day, we're all brothers and sisters. Do you know how equal we are? If I were to be cut and any human across the globe were to be cut, the color of the blood would still be the same. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. I don't believe that I spoke for 50 minutes. Do you believe it? I don't believe it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. I want us, and I'm going to say this for the last time. From this day, let's become more conscious of how we make people feel. Wallahi, that is something that will change the world. It will change you, your life. Look at how you make people feel. Even if they make you feel crappy to use the word. Never mind, it's okay. Don't become an ugly person because someone else's behavior was ugly. No, don't lose your goodness because someone else displayed their evil. You're a good person, remain good. And I end by saying, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who do good. That should be the driving force behind us doing good. I do good to you, not because I think you deserve it or you don't deserve it, but because I know that Allah loves those who do good. So whether you do good to me or not is irrelevant. Whether you may, according to others, deserve it or not 
is irrelevant to me because I'm doing it for a much more noble purpose. Do you get what I'm saying? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us. I pray that inshallah we meet again sometime. If not in Bradford, then inshallah in Jannah. Say Amin. Amen. And if not in Jannah, then in Bradford. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all of us.